All right, Blake, let it roll. All right. Thank you, Joe. Um, actually, it's a good place to get started is by giving wherever you are. First of all, welcome everybody, but giving Joe Klementovich a virtual applause. Uh, as I mentioned in our first evening, um, Zoom seems very simple until you have to figure out how to get 320 plus people in the same room and then it becomes much more complex. Uh, and Joe has really been handling all that for us. So thank you very much, Joe. Uh, once again, welcome everybody. Uh, this is pretty, in, uh, pretty incredible. We <laughs> usually have about 170, maybe 200 people in a good year in the auditorium. And like I said, the room's pretty crowded right now. Um, I love to see the enthusiasm for um, early and ongoing education um, for our upcoming winter season. Um, or if you're like Eric, you've had the winter for about three or four weeks now already, apparently in Cook City. Um, yeah. for, those, <laughs> for those of you that are new, um, Esau is in its 10th year, which is actually pretty incredible. Um, I, I uh, was talking to Frank about this earlier, and I remember when it was uh, folded metal chairs in, if I recall correctly, the middle school in North Conway. Um, oh, I think that was was where we were hosting it so uh it, 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 polar. yeah yeah and i think the first year it was 20 seats in the basement of the observatory's uh museum <laughs> even better so yeah so uh we we have come a long way and that is in large part due to all of your uh participation so once again thank you for being here uh the white mountain avalanche education foundation we do a couple of different things uh we help host esaw obviously we also run youth avalanche courses uh, throughout the winter, uh, usually two if we have uh, a lot of uh, interest. Um, and we also host ongoing um, educational talks throughout the season as well. Um, so be on the lookout for more information coming from us throughout the season. Uh, ESAW or whatever SAW is in your area is a great place to get started, to get going. But obviously we want that learning to continue all the way throughout the winter. Um, that includes this, whether it's your first season in the backcountry or your 20th, uh, that learning is always occurring. So we help to fill that void a little bit. Um, we want to give a big shout out to Patagonia, who's tonight's sponsor. We will pick one lucky winner uh, who will receive either a Das Parka um, or Das Light Parka. Um, as I'm sure everybody knows right now, if you're scrambling to find ski gear, particularly backcountry gear, it's going quite fast. So uh, but don't worry, either jacket is absolutely incredible. Um, a note from Joe, you will get a link from him uh, at some point tomorrow when he after he relaxes a little bit with uh, tomorrow, the link to tomorrow night's presentation and then the same thing will repeat for Thursday. So, you know, just be nice to Joe. He'll, he'll, he'll get that link to you, don't <laughs> worry. Um, and let's see, this will be recorded, um, but we're not gonna release the recording until December. So also please be patient with that. And then if you have questions tonight, please put them in the Q and A uh, box, which is the bottom far right hand corner um, of your screen, not the leave, the one right before that where it says Q and A. And then last but not least, um, I had a very productive meeting this morning, uh, trying to forecast what the season would look like for all of us, whether you're on the East Coast or West Coast. Um, and it was through the lens or paradigm of risk management. And I was trying to think of a way to, to share some of the key takeaways of that with you all tonight. And the only thing I have written down is it's gonna be busy, hopefully snowy, and let's take care of each other. And that's about it. So with that being said, I'm gonna introduce Frank, um, who has been a wonderful mentor to me over the years. Um, he is adept at dealing with long-winded questions that I don't really know how to formulate yet, but he somehow sees through them and figures out a way to give me um, helpful advice uh, and answers. So without further ado, Frank, who's our head ranger here in the Mount Washington Valley, you're up. Thanks, Blake, and thanks to everybody coming. I've got a list of people to thank that's much too long and I'll forget people, so I won't even try, but especially thanks to those at the foundation uh, for putting this on and for all the hard work from folks at Friends of Tuckerman Ravine. Our first speaker tonight is Eric Knopf. I've known Eric for a while. We met and climbed together at an ISSW a bunch of years ago and uh, has stayed connected. He's been back here to present before. Um, and he's been a ski patrol or was a ski patroller, started his career at Snowbird before moving on to the Gallatin Avalanche Center um, 
in Bozeman area where he's a forecaster for 10 years. And uh, also along the way worked uh, a few seasons at the going to the Sun Highway, learning about wet avalanches and dangerous wet sloughs. Currently is the co-owner of the uh, co-owner and instructor at Six Points Avalanche Education in Western Montana where he is uh, currently doing lots of online presentations in addition to field-based classes. So he's gonna be talking to us about uh, some pretty uh, interesting stuff with stability tests. Take it away, Eric. Okay, thanks a lot, Frank. Um, let's see, I will see if I can... Can you see that okay? No, 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 it wasn't happening. There we go. There you go. Perfect. Looks good. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks for the intro, Frank. And uh, yeah, before I get going, I just want to say a huge thanks to the whole Esau crew for putting on this workshop. Um, obviously, the new normal uh, presents plenty of challenges, but um, I think it presents uh, a lot of great opportunities as well. And um, thanks to everybody uh, for attending. Obviously, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. So I'll kick off my talk here. And my talk is called A Collaborative Effort Using the ECT, the Extended Column Test, and the PST, the propagation saw test, to reduce false stable snowpack assessments. Now it's kind of a mouthful and kind of a complex title. And we're gonna dive into this more here in just a minute, but taking a step back and, and um, simplifying things a little bit. Um, if you're heading out into the backcountry, um, ECTs, PSTs, stability tests, those all kind of come down the road. But the first question uh, you need to be able to answer if you intend to, to head into the backcountry is, are you an avalanche terrain? Um, it's not as simple to answer as it sounds, but uh, you need to be, to be able to answer that question if you're an avalanche terrain. If stability is the question, if you're dealing with any stability issues at all, then terrain is the answer. Um, if you are not in avalanche terrain, it is impossible to get caught in an avalanche. So on a higher hazard day, you can have a blast uh, riding 25, 30 degree slopes, as long as those slopes aren't connected to steeper slopes above. And if you have a motor, obviously you can really have a blast um, in low angle terrain. But the fact is, is you can go out in unstable conditions and have a great time. You just have to be able uh, to avoid avalanche terrain. Now, I'm guessing most people um, who are attending this class aren't intending on just sticking to low angle slopes uh, for the entire winter. The goal is, right, to be able to go recreate an avalanche terrain and do it safely. And if you do head in onto steeper, more avalanche prone slopes, you have to make sure the snowpack is stable. There's absolutely nothing wrong with playing in avalanche terrain if you have a stable snowpack. So that's what you're trying. Those are the two pieces you're trying to put together. Am I in avalanche terrain? If you are in avalanche terrain, uh, is your snowpack stable? Now, the last thing you want to do is assume that the snowpack is stable when you jump onto a steep slope and have it be unstable. That's what we're trying to prevent. That is called a false stable. And false stables are really the last thing you wanna have happen. I apologize for the quality of this video, kind of grainy, but this skier obviously misjudged stability. And if you're filming, you might want to get out of the way 
if the slide is heading right at, at you. So that skier broke his femur, broke a couple ribs, was miraculously okay. They lost that camera in that avalanche. That, that slide was right outside Bridger Bowl um, near Bozeman. Um, I live in Bozeman, Montana. That's where I'm presenting from this evening. Um, and they went back in May and found that camera buried in the avalanche debris and the footage was still good. So the bottom line is, is if you are heading an avalanche train, you wanna make sure the snowpack is stable. If it's unstable, then um, it obviously can have severe consequences. So really snowpack assessment or stability assessment starts at home. It doesn't start once you're in avalanche terrain. Um, if you're heading out with, with an objective that's avalanche prone, you, you probably have an idea of what stability is like already. And that starts by checking the avalanche forecast, doing your homework, um, gathering information, gathering data before you actually go step foot um, in the avalanche prone slopes. So check out your, your local avalanche forecast. It's always the best step. Maybe you've been you know, hitting that area all season and you have a good idea of what the snowpack is like. Uh, but let's say we have this problem here on this particular forecast. We have a persistent weak layer. Um, the avalanche danger is moderate. Maybe that started out as a higher considerable danger. We haven't had a load for a while or the, the weak layer is gaining strength. Now we're at a moderate danger and that stability is improving. And you're like, yeah, I think I can start stepping foot in the more avalanche prone terrain. And then along the way, you're like, well, maybe we should do a stability test to kind of back up our thought process to gather more information. So you, you check, your, uh, check your avalanche forecast. You're always trying to gather clues that mother nature is presenting. You're looking for signs of instability, cracking, um, large collapsing, recent avalanche activity. I mean, those are um, the main pieces of information. And well, let's say you want to just back, back up your theory that the snowpack is getting stronger by doing a stability test or two. So this is a picture of an extended column test in ECT. And we're going to dive a little more into uh, ECTs and PSTs here in a minute. But let's say you just decide to do an ECT, you get an unstable test result. Um, that should be considered a sign of instability. I typically weigh an unstable test result similar to um, shooting cracks or, or collapsing, and that can um, ultimately change my decision. So again, stability tests are just one tool in the toolbox. They are not meant, uh, you should not base critical decisions off of, um, off of a snow pit or a stability test. But I think it's, I think stability tests, ECTs, PSTs, I think they're gaining a lot of popularity and people are getting more interested in how to do them and what they represent and how to interpret those tests. So having that tool in your toolbox isn't a bad idea. So what, what are stability tests? Um, this is a definition from avalanche.org which is a great website. If you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend checking out avalanche.org. It's where you can find all the different avalanche centers in the US and they have a lot of great um, other information on there as well. And so their definition on avalanche.org is though commonly called stability tests, these tests should, be, should really be called instability tests. And I think that's an important point to make and an important point to remember um, think of them as instability tests. That's what you're hunting for. They're used to search for possible instability in the snowpack. Due to spatial variability, you never want to use a test to tell you the snowpack is stable. Rather, you want to use stability tests to tell you conditions are unstable on a day you might think conditions are stable. So why do we use stability tests? So there's multiple reasons that we, that we do these tests. So from a practitioner standpoint, and that's kind of what we're talking about, uh, from a recreational standpoint, from a practitioner standpoint, if we are heading in to the backcountry, we, we want to assess snow stability before we step into avalanche terrain. So stability tests are used to hunt for instability. Um, so they are ultimately designed to help us make more conservative decisions. 
They are not designed to help us make more aggressive decisions. We should never venture into avalanche terrain based on a stable stability test. If you're, if you're at all um, suspicious of, of the snowpack stability. So they're, they help us make conservative decisions. Um, they just provide one piece of information um, in the larger picture. So more information is better. I always think that good decisions in the backcountry are based off of information. So the more information you have, uh, the better your decision-making process is gonna be. And another really important reason that, that I like digging snow pits and doing stability tests is they make us slow down. They make us look at the snow and communicate with our partners. Um, just clicking out of your skis or stepping off your sled, you can learn a lot just from doing that. And then just the process of digging in the snow um, is, is gonna give you valuable information. And then you slow down you do a couple stability tests and this whole time you're talking with your partners and communication is just such an important factor of, of safe travel um, in the backcountry in avalanche terrain. So I think they're a very helpful tool for um, making us slow down and communicate. So that's from a practitioner standpoint, from a recreational standpoint, but I think they're also great tools from a professional scientific standpoint. Um, as a forecaster, I was, uh, or I still use stability tests all the time to help track um, snowpack structure and snow stability. So is our persistent weak layer, is our depth hard at the ground? Is it getting stronger? Are our tests um, indicating improving stability? Is it staying the same? Um, if we get a big load, can we expect to see more avalanches? I think they're really helpful tools for helping track snow stability. Uh, they help forecasters convey a specific message to backcountry recreationalists. If, I think if you go to any avalanche center these days, videos are obviously a super useful tool. And more often than not, you'll see forecasters doing, or you'll see them in videos doing stability tests, either the ECT or the PST. And I think they can be like, here's our weak layer. I'll do a PST. You can really see that thing collapse and propagate. This is what we're worried about. So I think they help convey a message pretty clearly. Um, they help us better understand fracture mechanics and avalanche release. I think if, you, if you've been to any other saws, I don't think there's really a fracture um, talk in this saw, but um, you'll see a lot of talks these days on fracture speed and fracture mechanics, the process of avalanche release. And you'll see people more often than not, um, the propagation saw test is pretty much the specific um, stability test used to demonstrate um, fracture mechanics. And so they, I think they really help us better understand that whole process. And then they're also a useful educational tool. Uh, when I'm teaching classes, even if I'm with a, a beginning group or a beginner group, um, I like to just do a, an ECT or a PST. These, this crew may not have any idea how to conduct that test, but if I do a test and be like, here's our weak layer, see, you can see that thing collapse and propagate. And, it, and it's a useful tool to help explain how remote triggering works, um, how you can trigger a slope from the bottom, low angle or flat terrain, and how that weak layer is capable of collapsing and propagating up that slope. So I think they're, they're pretty useful educational tools as well. So I'll just give a little demo here, a little explanation on the ECT, the extended column test. Most people probably are familiar with the ECT. It's the most popular um, stability test used in the field these days. So it's a 90 centimeter, uh, it's a column 90 centimeters long by 30 centimeters deep done on the front wall of your snow pit. You apply, a, you isolate the, the column on all sides using a probe or two probes and a cord. And you wanna make sure that column is isolated below your weak layer. Then you put a shovel on one end and you apply your standard loading steps, 10 from the wrist, 10 from the elbow, 10 from the shoulder. And I'm just gonna play a quick video here. I'm just gonna kind of speed this up so you do, I like to do a shovel shear. 
on one end, just to clear. I got my shovels here. I have an open space here. I'm gonna go 30, 30 centimeters. Yeah, I'm gonna go Can you guys hear that? Centimeters across 30, 60. 90 most snow saws these days have a 30 and a 35 centimeter mark on them. 30 up. Throw in the probe vertically like that. Peter, would you mind giving me a hand real quick? And this method is actually easier with two people. So the string is going to go around the probe. I'm going to mark 30 centimeters up in a few different places. The cord's just going to follow that line there. Just kind of saw your way down. <laughs> we need to use like a chainsaw to cut through our snow. All right, so we've got below this layer of surface ore. And this way is a little bit better when you have a dense hard slab. Um, you don't quite have the friction on your cord um, as the other um, two pro methods. So then a quick high wedge on one side. So you want to make sure your column is nice and clean. I usually put the shovel on the open end of my column. And from the wrist, and from the elbow, just kind of a nice rhythm. You don't need to go super fast or super slow. 10 from the shoulder. And again, that collapsed, propagated all the way across ECTP 24. I think that was that is an unstable result on this layer of surface. So that was just a, a quick demo on an extended column test. Um, it does take practice on how to set those up and you know do the test properly and how to interpret the test. And there's different scores and different ways you can interpret the test. We're not going to dive into that too much right now. Well, that was just a demonstration on how to do and set up an extended column test. Now, the second test that I'm going to talk about is the PST, the propagation saw test. So with the ECT, you're assessing both initiation and propagation. So when you're, when you're applying force to that column, you're seeing how much force it actually takes to initiate a fracture in that weak layer. So the ECT is good for assessing initiation and propagation. The PST, the propagation saw test, is actually done on the sidewall of your snow pit. Um, again, a nice clean column. The PST is typically 100 centimeters long. The dimensions can vary a little bit, but we'll, for simplicity purposes, we'll keep it um, normally. It's 100 centimeters long, 30 centimeters wide, isolated all the way around with a cord and a probe. And with the PST, you are not applying any force to the column. You are finding that weak layer, you're putting the blunt end of your saw in that weak layer, and you're trying to initiate a fracture in that weak layer. And you're trying to determine if that weak layer is capable of collapsing and propagating to the end of the column. Now, if your cut length is less than half of the column length, if your cut length is less than 50 centimeters, and you get this entire weak layer to collapse and propagate to the end of the column, that is considered an unstable test result. If your cut length is longer than 50 centimeters and you get a collapse and propagation, that's a stable test result, or you could get slab fracture or fracture or rest. Those are also um, stable results. And I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. So this is just a quick demo on how to, how to do a PST. Um, the test score is PST 31 over 100 to end. That means my cut length was 31 centimeters uh, before I got a collapse in full propagation. Okay, we did an ECT, ECTN, stable result, CPST, unstable result. Now we're going to do a standard upslope PST. 
see what that tells us. That sounded like a sudden collapse, propagated to end, cut length. 31 over 100 to end, which is also an unstable result. So you can see with the PST, I'm leaving that slab completely intact. I'm targeting that weak layer specifically with my saw. And it's with the PST, it's really pretty obvious if you get that unstable result. You usually get that sudden collapse and you can see it um, go to the end of the column. Okay. So how many people in this audience use stability tests? Obviously, I can't see you, but I'm guessing uh, a fair amount of you have used stability tests at least at some point in the past. How many of you use the ECT, the extended column test? All right, I'm seeing some hands. How about the PST? How many people are using PSTs these days? Okay, I'm seeing less hands. Um, and that is consistent with data that I have extracted from Snowpilot. Um, so this graph is, is representing numbers from 2010 to 2018. During this time frame, there were 15,540 snow pits entered into Snowpilot. Uh, just to explain what Snowpilot is, it's an online snow profile program um, that I, I find really useful and it's got great information. And if you don't have a Snowpilot uh, account, I highly recommend you go to snowpilot.org and set up your own account. You can um, log all of your, your profile data, your snow pit data, and it's um, and it also just has great, and you can look at other people's snow pits from really around the world. So it's a, it's a pretty cool um, program. But um, during this time, there were actually like 20,000 snow pits um, entered into, into Snowpilot. But these are just um, snow pits that have at least one stability test. So you can see the CT, the compression test. We're not going to dive into the compression test too much right now, but that's a 30 centimeter column by 30 centimeter column isolated on all sides. Most people are probably familiar with the, with the compression test. And you can see out of um, all the profiles that are entered with at least one stability test, you know, roughly 70% have a, a compression test. Now, when we're talking about the ECT, the extended column test, this is by far the most used stability test um, or the most common stability test entered into Snowpilot. But I think it's the most heavily used from a practitioner standpoint, um, 75 to 77% of snow pits that have a stability test have at least one ECT. And I mean, that's pretty good. These numbers have not changed from 2010 to 2018. You can see they stay very steady. Uh, the Roosh block, the good old standby, um, less than 1%. Not too many people are, are doing or recording Roosh blocks these days. The stuff block test uh, never really gained much traction and less than 1% are using the stuff block. The shovel tilt or the shovel shear test. I think a lot of people are doing these, but not recording their scores. But the next test I really wanna focus on is the propagation saw test. And you can see roughly 12 to 13% of people entering or doing snow pits and with stability tests are doing PSTs. So 77% ECT, 13% with the PST. So my goal, I would like to see these numbers get closer together. So if you, if you create a snow pilot um, account, you enter, I, I, say, I recommend people do an ECT and a PST on the same slab weak layer combination in the same snow pit. It sounds like a lot of digging and a lot of work, but it actually goes by pretty quick once you once you get used to doing it. And ultimately doing both of these tests can help you reduce um, a false, getting a false stable reading. And I'm gonna explain that more here in a minute. But um, I'd like to see these numbers get a little closer. And I ultimately think that's gonna help us understand which test works best with what type of snowpack structure. So I think there's a lot to learn 
and how these tests um, relate with one another. And this is just a, a, a photo um, of a snow pilot profile. Um, you know, you got your location, uh, your name, your coordinates, your temp, your precip, your sky cover. You have all the good stuff that you can enter in there. Your stability tests, ECTP 28, PST 34 over 100 to N, both unstable results on this crappy layer of depth horror down here at the base of the snowpack. So this is just an example of what, uh, what a snow profile looks like in Snowpilot. So if we dive into this a little bit more, two possible reasons the PST is less utilized than the ECT. I think the number one reason is that it's not taught in avalanche classes. And I think people are just less familiar with it and people just don't know how to do it and they don't have confidence with it. And I think just uh, people's lack of familiarity is the number one reason that PSTs are less uh, utilized than the ECT. And a second reason, and this comes from talking with more forecasters and uh, professionals in the industry, they don't wanna use the PST because it has this perceived false stable rate of 30 to 44%. Now, the higher your false stable rate um, with a stability test, the worse that is, uh, false stables are bad. Uh, well, the ECT has a perceived false stable rate of five to 10%. So false stable rate for the PST, 30 to 44%, ECT false stable rate, 5 to 10%. Um, I think people just don't want to use the PST because they think it's going to give them false information. It's going to indicate the snowpack is stable when in fact the snowpack is unstable. So what is a false stable? That's kind of what we were just, or what I was just talking about. A false stable is a test that indicates stable conditions when in fact the slope is unstable. This is the most dangerous scenario you can have when dealing with stability tests. You do not want something to indicate stability when in fact it's unstable. So unstables happen all across life. Even Will Ferrell can have a false stable. Okay, false stables, building bunk beds can be bad, but uh, not that high of consequences there. I think uh, Will Farrell got a little scratch on his elbow and um, turned out to be okay. But if you get a false stable, put into practice. When you're recreating an avalanche terrain, uh, consequences can be much more severe. Now this sure looks pretty stable to me. It's important to remember that tracks do not always indicate stability, but I would feel pretty comfortable skiing this, this slope right here. But that guy as, assumed the snowpack was, was stable, when in fact the snowpack was unstable. And that's when you can get yourself into trouble. So you want to try to avoid that false stable at all costs. So I've done some digging myself. I'm curious on the relationship between the ECT and the PST. The ECT has this perceived false stable rate of 5 to 10%. The PST has this perceived false stable rate of 30 to 40%. So I've collected a bunch of data over the past four or five winters with some help from uh, some other folks. And I have accumulated a data set of 394 data points. Each data point is an ECT and a PST done on the same slab weak layer combination in the same snow pit. Uh, the data was collected by myself, <clears throat> my friend Ben Vandenboss from the Sawtooth Avalanche Center has collected a lot of data for me and I've extracted some from Snowpilot as well. So out of 394 individual data points, 
270 uh, times or 270 data points, um, the tests agree with one another. So roughly 70% of the time, the ECT and the PST are either gonna both give you stable results or they're both gonna give you unstable results. So they agree with one another. But what about the 31% of the time, the 124 data points where they disagree with one another? So out of 78 out of 124, uh, the ECT was showing stable results while the PST was showing unstable results. So that's 63% of the time the PST was actually showing unstable results. Um, and 37% of the time, the ECT would show unstable results and the PST would show stable results. Now, if you think about the false stable rate of the PST being much higher than the ECT, you think these numbers would be flipped. You would think the ECT would show unstable results much more frequently than the PST. But my data is actually showing that the PST propagates just as readily, if not more readily than the ECT. So I think the false stable rate of the PST is actually much closer um, to that of the ECT. So two reasons, two possible reasons the PST is showing unstable results when the ECT is showing stable results. I think it's pretty common understanding that when you have a thick, dense slab, it's really difficult to generate enough force with your standard loading steps, with your 10 from the wrist, 10 from the elbow, 10 from the shoulder, especially if you're dealing with like these pencil hard wind slabs or uh, just really dense slabs sitting over persistent weak layers. It can sometimes be hard to generate enough force to impact or to, to initiate a fracture. And then also when the slab has lost strength and integrity um, after a prolonged high pressure. So when you go into these long high pressure spells, um, the, the surface of your snowpack actually starts to facet and that decreases the strength and decreases the integrity of your slab. And you can get ECT ends when you're pounding on the slab, you'll actually get slab fracture. And I'll show a, a quick demo of that here in a minute. But this is a dense slab. The snowpack actually isn't very deep. The snowpack is less than a meter deep. It's only about a 60 centimeter slab sitting over a layer of depth floor near the ground. And Doug Chabot is just wailing on it, trying to get it to collapse. Doing the deep tap ECT here. And you can see he's finally wailing on it to the point where he was able to initiate a fracture down in this weak layer near the ground but that would be considered a stable test result. Through your standard loading steps, 10 from the wrist, 10 from the elbow, 10 from the shoulder, he was unable to get a result on this persistent weak layer near the ground. And that is called an ECTX, no result. And unfortunately my camera died this day, uh, but we were doing PSTs on this same weak layer and we were getting really short cut lengths um, indicating unstable conditions. And we saw numerous large avalanches on this layer. So um, we knew the snowpack was unstable, but the ECT was just having a difficult time generating enough force to get down there. Um, so this is a, an example. We hadn't had snow for maybe two weeks. Um, the surface of this slab was, or the surface of the snowpack was starting to facet significantly. And this, just the overall integrity of the slab was starting to break down. So you can see this fracture here, this slab fracture. So that was an ECTN. It did not collapse and propagate all the way across the column. It actually slab fractured because that slab just didn't have, oops didn't have the integrity to, to communicate that fracture. And, but here's a PST done on that same snowpack structure. You can hear that sudden collapse. Um, 
cut length of 30 centimeters over 100 to n, that would be an unstable test result on that layer of surface ore. This is just another video kind of showing both tests. Again, um, trying to assess a layer of depth hoar about a foot off the ground. Depth hoar is just really the worst persistent problem you can have. Ow. All right, let me try something. So I'm trying to ACTN. Didn't take much though. Well, I still don't trust it. So I, I wasn't trusting that snowpack just because of the poor snowpack structure. Here I'm doing a PST. And here that sudden collapse. Just for time purposes, I'm gonna, it was a cut length of like 30 centimeters over 100 to end, indicating an unstable test result. It's, uh, I'm not, I'm not trusting any slope that has facets uh, buried this deep in the pack. And so this was uh, three or four feet deep. Uh, so I dug that snow pit right up about 300 yards from this, this chute right in the middle. A snowmobiler was riding up this chute literally an hour after I dug that snow pit. I dug that snow pit right over here near this couar and got unstable results in my PSTs. An hour later, a snowmobiler was climbing this chute, triggered the entire thing. He was able to make the turn into the trees and avoid uh, being caught. His buddies down here in the run out all got out of the way. Uh, but it was just kind of confirmation that, you know, stability tests can actually give you reliable information. And it was backed up by a large uh, human triggered avalanche. So this is an interesting paper, uh, the role of slabs in weak layers in fracture arrest or fracture propagation, um, written by Carl Berkland. I was an author on this paper, but this is just a quote um, from the paper, since an intact slab is required for propagation, compromising the integrity of the slab will arrest fractures. Thus, when conducting propagation tests, especially with uh, new soft slabs or decomposing slabs, keeping surface snow undisturbed is important. Compromising slab integrity could potentially compromise test results. So when you're just, when you set up your ECT and you're just bang, you know, pounding on it, you're actually disrupting that slab uh, to the point that can give you um, ECT ends or slab fractures, potentially false stable test results. So again, that's a good time when you might wanna do both tests. So two possible reasons, the ECT shows unstable results when the PST shows stable results. When the weak layer is thin, when you have these really thin layer of near surface facets or a thin layer of surface ore, keeping your saw in that layer is, uh, can be really difficult. And that's the thing about the PST is that you have to keep your saw in that weak layer. If it wavers at all, uh, you could end up with a skewed result. So super important to keep that saw in that weak layer. And when the slab is soft, uh, fist to four finger hardness, um, you might, the slab just doesn't have the enough strength or cohesion to communicate that fracture. So this was a huh. Look at slab, that. slab fracture. So this is, uh, we were doing a PST on a layer of surface hoar uh, capped by about 18 inches of new snow. 
And that slab just didn't have the cohesion, the integrity to, to communicate that fracture. But we were seeing quite a few avalanches on this, on this setup. So absolutely no way we were going in avalanche terrain, uh, but our PSTs were giving us um, stable results, which was, were obviously false stables. And so this is uh, trying to follow a really thin layer of surface ore. Nothing. It was arresting. So I was like, it was arresting. I was putting my saw in that thin layer of surface ore, and I could see little cracks shoot out from my saw, but they were only going a couple inches, and then they just didn't have that that right setup to to communicate that fracture. But then I did uh, PST on a more developed layer of surface ore, you know, another foot down and that you could hear that sudden collapse all the way to the end of the column. And that's actually another nice thing about the propagation saw test is you leave your slab intact and you're actually able to assess, you know, if you have multiple weak layers in your snowpack, you can actually do if starting from the top, working your way down or down bottom up to, doesn't really matter, but you can, uh, assess different layers in one test. So what happens when the test produces, or when one test produces stable results and the other test produces unstable results? Um, err on the side of caution. I mean, that's just the bottom line. You should always put more weight into those unstable test results. Again, they should be considered a sign of instability, a, like a womb for a shooting crack. Um, so I, that's why I think it's important to do both tests. It's going to give you, uh, valuable information. So in conclusion, no stability test is perfect. There are pros and cons to each test. Um, more information is better using the ECT, the extended column test and the PST, the propagation saw test on the same slab weak layer combination can produce a more comprehensive stability assessment, decreasing the potential for false stable test results. That's kind of the premise of this whole talk is to, to do tests that are gonna reduce uh, the potential for getting a false stable. And doing both of those tests uh, can really help do that. And more data needs to be collected, but the false stable rate of the PST 30 to 44% uh, may be original or maybe lower than originally thought, and it may be much closer uh, to the ECT five to ten percent. So that's what I have for you, and I hope you got something out of that talk. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. Great, thanks for that, Eric. That was great. Thanks for doing that work and putting that data together. That really helped eliminate what's uh, the, the perception that people have, uh, or misperception, I should say, that people have about these tests. Since you've been yeah. talking, we've gotten quite a few answers, or sorry, quite a few questions on the Q&A um, chat box. I'll try to get to as many as I can, lump them together a little bit. Um, some of these we might be able to answer later, but here's one. Here's one from Max Spurlick. Um, if you do an ECT and get a stable result, how do you pick which weak layer to test with the PST, assuming that there are multiple weak layers in the snowpack? Well, if you're, if you're getting a, a stable result uh, on your ECT, um, then you need, with the PST, I mean, you can target more than one. So, um, I think you need to really pick your, your um, layer of concern. So your LO, LOC is, uh, is really, you should have an idea of what that is. Is it a layer of surface hoar 20 centimeters down or is it a layer of depth hoar near the base of your snowpack? Um, if you get a stable result on your ECT, you should have an idea of what layer you're targeting and then go ahead and target that layer uh, with the PST. And again, you can target numerous weak layers um, in one, one PST. So that's Thanks. kind of generally what I do. And, and uh, yeah, sometimes, you know, you get a, 
a, a, just a bomber test result in your ECT, I always do my ECTs first. Um, I think doing an ECT first really helps you, um, you know, assess what your structure is and what layers you're then going to target with your with your PST. And there's you don't need to do both tests all the time. Um, if you know you have a fairly strong snowpack and you're doing you do an ECT and you're just banging the crap out of it and you're not you're getting stable results. I mean, you might not even have weak layers to to shoot for with a PST. Uh, but I think it's those situations when you're just unsure of what, you know, what the structure is like, or your ECT, or it's given ECTNs or ECTXs. If I'm consistently getting propagation in my ECTs, I'm getting ECTPs kind of one after another, um, there, there are plenty of times when I won't even do a PST. I mean, that's giving me the information right. I need to know. Right. Sometimes, you know, just defaulting to the most obvious mm -hmm. is the right thing to do. Um, another kind of number of questions, many from Avalanche instructors, I think people noticed that uh, maybe these are plants in the audience, but they're asking about the cross slope uh, column tests. And uh, some somebody, I, I suggest uh, this might be a good opportunity for you to explain uh, your theory of cross slope versus uh, side mm -hmm. of the pit. How, how much time do we have? How about in, how about in 20 seconds or less? <laughs> <laughs> the cross slope PST is basically um, a PST. It's set up the exact same as a standard PST done on the sidewall of your snow pit. Uh, it's 100 centimeters long, 30 centimeters deep, isolated, just like your ECT. I, I find it um, a lot easier to do a, a CPST right behind my ECT. Uh, but again, you're targeting that weak layer with the saw. And I think it. Um, I've done hundreds of cross slope PSTs and compared them. And that's a whole nother paper that I have set up, but uh, or in a whole nother talk. But the, the cross slope PST actually gives you the same test result as the upslope PST 90% of the time. I mean, the, the cut lengths vary maybe five to 10 centimeters from each other. But if you get an unstable test result on a standard PST, it's more than likely you're going to get almost an identical test result on a, on a CPST. And there is some slope angle influence in there. But again, with snow pits, you never want to dig your snow pit on a, on a steep slope or a slope that's prone to avalanching. You, you can dig your snow pits on representative slopes that are less than 35 degrees, less than 30 degrees. And it'll give you the, the same test results. So that's the bottom line with snow pits is never expose yourself to avalanche hazard to dig a snow pit. Um, and slope yeah. angle, these stability tests are actually independent of slope angle. They, they operate the same. Um, if, this, if the snowpack structure is the same on a low angle slope as it is on a steep slope, uh, your test will give you the same results. So don't put yourself in harm's yeah. way. That's exactly, that's great to reiterate that point, Eric. Thanks. And that's, that's something we, um, I think people do a lot and uh, just not a good idea. There's a lot of options here for, for safe uh, spots to dig those that are not on a steep slope and you can see the results either way. And I think with a PST particularly, um, you know, cross slope, side slope or flat no slope, um, that collapse is evident and obvious when it does. Yeah, and if people are, are curious about the cross slope PST, uh, just feel free to email me uh, anytime. If you have questions, I'd be happy to talk more about, about that specific test. Info yeah. at avalancheclass.com. There you go. Info at avalancheclass.com. A um, couple of uh, couple other questions here. Um, well, let's just pick one more. Um, so on the aggregated data where the, let's see. So do you think that where the PST aggregate, where the slope was um, less stable than the ECT results, do you think the slope angle, the tests were done, seemed to influence the correlation at all? Or does your data reveal anything about PSTs performed in pits dug on lower? Okay, we just 
Sorry, we just answered that about slope angle. One no, more thing I'll let you go. Any difference between Eastern US snowpacks versus Western snowpacks to consider in ECT versus PST in this conversation? Uh, well, we were, we were, we were kind of chatting about that uh, um, be, before we really got going. And, and it seems like back East, you guys are dealing with a lot of uh, very dense windblown snow. And if that, you know, the denser your slab, the harder it's going to be to initiate a fracture in that weak layer with, with your standard loading steps. So it's, uh, the PST is never a bad option when you have a really thick, dense slab. But again, do you have a persistent weak layer? That, that's kind of your, another question. Do you have that structure that, that's capable of, of producing an avalanche? If you just have five feet of dense windblown snow, then you probably don't need to do a stability test. But, uh, yeah. but it seems like back east, you're dealing with a lot of dense windblown snow. So PST uh, probably is not a bad option. Yeah, we, we have found that to be handy. And, you know, we have such spatial variability. I think that, um, you know, the slab thickness is such that you can go find the place with the right thickness of, um, of, a, of a strong slab over the weak layer, and then you'll go on the slope you want to ski, and that, that slab varies in thickness from thin to thick. So it, it's really really tough and um, we we end up with these um, kind of days where there's we're getting moderate to unstable results and you know no one finds the trigger point um, uh, yeah it's you know, <laughs> the, weak, the weak layer is not obvious and we have the spatial variability driven um, kind of and, and I ski on those days too it's like well that's why we have a beacon and that's why we are gonna just use the terrain to our advantage really is the main thing. Um, yeah, yeah, but that yeah. obviously variability, that's the, the trickiest part. Yeah. And uh, Good, well, um, I think we're gonna have to answer some of these. We gotta, we gotta move on at this point to Grant. It's eight o'clock now and uh, thanks for joining us, Eric. That was awesome. And, Thank you. Um, catch up to you later and be sure to check out uh, Eric. Uh, he's got a good, um, good bunch of classes and social media out there. Thanks again, Eric. Thank you. Well, uh, looking forward to Grant's talk. Yep. All right, so next up we have Grant Statham, who is a Parks Canada Visitor Safety Specialist, um, sort of our equivalent of a uh, of a you know NPA National Park Service ranger, um, he um, works in the Banff Yoho Kootenay National Parks area. He's been a climber, forecaster, and as a internationally certified mountain guide for 30 years, and has been with Parks Canada for 17 of those. And he's going to talk tonight about an incident that occurred um, recently, um, pretty harrowing rescue, um, uh, kind of a sensitive subject as well. And I just want to take this moment to explain to folks that um, this portion of the ESAW is not going to be recorded out of respect for um, families involved uh, associated with victims. So take it away, Grant. Thank and you. Thanks, for joining us. thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Sounds good.